Welcome back to the lecture series, the ideas behind constitutions and their role in securing and protecting or violating human rights. The case of the United States of America, I'm Edward J. Dodson. This is lecture five, progressive socialists and single taxers battle against laissez-faire conservatives. Theodore Roosevelt, raised to the presidency after the assassination of McKinley, soon faced a major national problem when the anthracite coal miners went on strike in 1902. Ignoring precedent, Roosevelt called the parties to the Capitol to work out a compromise. Not surprisingly, the conservative New York Journal of Commerce joined others objecting to what they saw as an unwarranted attack on laissez-faire capitalism. The paper wrote, the president's course magnifies before the public the importance and power of the unions, casts an unwarranted stigma upon the position and rights of the operators, and adds a trades union issue to the many unwelcome politico-economic questions of the hour. Worse by far than any possible strike is Mr. Roosevelt's seemingly uncontrollable penchant for impulsive self-intrusion. Roosevelt was not moved. His attorney general had already brought suit calling for the dissolution of J.P. Morgan's and Edward H. Harriman's Northern Securities Company and its monopolistic railroad holdings. Many wondered how far Roosevelt might go along the path of new laws and regulations reigning in corporate power and wealth. Frederick Lewis Allen writes, the battle between the president and the emerging plutocracy during the next few years was destined to be an intermittent and often half-hearted one. The reason was not far to seek. Roosevelt was a Republican president. He could not get too far out of step with his party. Among its members were the great majority of the rich and privileged, and the party needed their lavish financial contributions at campaign time. That same year, the public was educated by Ida Tarbell on the inner workings of the Standard Oil Company, which was serialized in McClure's beginning in November of 1902. Thus began that revolt of the American conscience, which was to be the dominant phenomenon in American affairs until about 1915, when it was submerged in the oncoming tides of World War I, and which finally petered out about 1920, leaving behind it, however, influences and patterns of thinking that were to continue to this day, 1952. Then came another financial panic in 1907. The time had come to impose some level of control over corporations. A new corporate tax was passed in 1909. In February of 1913, the income tax amendment to the Constitution was ratified and a modest graduated income tax was adopted. Next on the reform agenda was to amend the Constitution to permit the direct election of U.S. Senators. By 1910, 31 state legislatures had passed resolutions calling for a constitutional amendment allowing direct election. Republican Senators opposed to the amendment were not re-elected. The amendment was finally ratified on the 8th of April 1913 by the required three-quarters of the state legislatures. Faith in the Republic and in the true meaning of democracy was strengthened by this expansion of popular elections. Belief was widespread that corporations and the wealthy would not be able to exert as much influence as they could under legislative selection. Perhaps the era of politics behind closed doors and smoke-filled rooms was coming to an end. To those committed to reform, there was much more to come. Popular initiatives, referenda, and direct primaries in which voters would choose party candidates during primary elections rather than having conventions of party elites pick the candidates were among the other leading reforms that spread throughout the states. 
The first real campaign finance legislation, the Tillman Act, was passed in 1907. Corporations were, from that point until just recently, banned from making contributions to campaigns. Theodore Roosevelt was far from satisfied. The nation's huge business enterprises could not be effectively regulated by state or local government. There are many wrongs to right. There are many and powerful wrongdoers against whom to war. And it would be base to shrink from the contest or to fail to wage it with a high, a resolute will. But I am sure that we shall win in the contest because I know that the heart of our people is sound. We believe in democracy as regards political rights, as regards education, and finally, as regards industrial conditions. By democracy, we understand securing, as far as it is humanly possible to secure it, equality of opportunity, equality of the conditions under which each man is to show the stuff that is in him, and to achieve the measure of success to which his own force of mind and character entitle him. In 1914, only a few years out of college, the future founding editor of the New Republic, Walter Lippmann, offered an analysis of all that was going on in a book titled Drift and Mastery. Already, the young journalist worried that the American system was flawed in significant ways. He wrote, The issues that we face are very different from those of the last century and a half. The difference, I think, might be summed up roughly this way. Those who went before inherited a conservatism and overthrew it. We inherit freedom and have to use it. The sanctity of property, the patriarchal family, hereditary caste, this dogma of sin, obedience to authority, the rock of ages, in brief, has been blasted for us. The leading thought of our world has ceased to regard commercialism either as permanent or desirable. And the only real question among intelligent people is how business methods are to be altered, not whether they are to be altered. For no one, unafflicted with invincible ignorance, desires to preserve our economic system in its existing form. To this book, Professor Saterman attaches significant importance. Drift and Mastery provides the key to understanding the ethos behind what is probably the most underappreciated period in American history. Lippmann argued that the nation had entered a period of drift, a lack of control over dynamic forces in the world, and that drive was the source of the current unrest in the country. Business had been radically transformed by the huge corporation, the integrated industry, production for a world market, the network of communications, pools and agreements, and the rise of consumerism. Social life had been transformed as well. Urbanization shifted people from country to city, breaking the loyalties of place, and the traditional order, the sanctity of property, the patriarchal family, hereditary caste, the dogma of sin, obedience to authority, now survived only as habits or by default. One indication of how attitudes were changing came from Frederick C. Howe, director of the People's Institute in New York City, who expressed support for women's suffrage in an article appearing in the 16th of March 1912 issue of Collier's Weekly. Howe wrote, I want woman's suffrage because I believe women will correct many of these law-made wrongs that man has made, for women will vote in terms of human life rather than terms of special privilege. Was Howe correct in his expectation for the female gender? Howe would go on to play an extremely important role as Commissioner of Immigration for the Port of New York. Reality reached up to Theodore Roosevelt as well by 1914. To Roosevelt, the democracy was already seriously at risk. He stated, There can be no real political democracy unless there is something approaching an economic democracy. There can be neither political nor industrial democracy unless people are reasonably well-to-do, 
and also reasonably able to achieve the difficult task of self-mastery. What Roosevelt meant by self-mastery, I think, is our capacity when given the opportunity and encouragement to achieve our full potential as human beings. The philosopher Mortimer J. Adler describes the conditions of a just society as providing for both goods of the body and goods of the mind. Adler wrote, The goods of the body are food and drink, sleep, clothing, and shelter. These are goods we need because they are indispensable for sustaining life. To be without them in sufficient quantity is a life-threatening deprivation. To possess them is not only necessary, but also a source of pleasure and enjoyment. The goods of the mind are information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. We seek these goods not just in order to live, but in order to live well. Possessing them lifts us above the plane of animal existence. For these goods enhance our existence as human beings, as well as providing enjoyment and pleasure. The nation was a long way from any systemic changes in governance that would meet Mortimer Adler's test. There was still a strong faith in unbridled individualism, even if, for the majority, individual advancement was limited. On how we might get to this state where every person has a reasonable opportunity to obtain these goods and enjoy a decent human existence is where we find disagreement and ideological divisions. In his many books, Adler tried to make the case for world government committed to the principles of democratic socialism. He offered his own insights into the meaning of the U.S. Constitution in the book We Hold These Truths, published in 1987. He writes, The American Constitution created the first federal republic in the history of the world. The first objective or aim mentioned in its preamble, a purpose distinctly different from all other objectives thereafter mentioned, is, quote, to form a more perfect union. Union of what? Of the 13 sovereign states that in the preceding five years had been united under the Articles of Confederation. A federal republic is seen to involve a plurality of sovereignties. On the one hand, the sovereignty of one national or federal government, and on the other hand, the sovereignty of each of the several federated states. Adler made no distinction between the 13 original states and those later admitted out of what eventually became federal territories, with the special case of Texas, which gained its sovereignty by war against the Mexican government. This was still the age of the railroad, and Theodore Roosevelt faced one great challenge of trying to rein them in, as explained by Professor Sitterman. In the new economy of the early 20th century, interstate commerce is now chiefly conducted by railroads, and the great corporation has supplanted the mass of small partnerships or individuals. Roosevelt's desire for national governmental power over the economy was merely a proposal to carry out to the letter one of the prime purposes, if not the prime purpose, for which the Constitution was founded. Important constitutional issues would soon come before Louis D. Brandeis, appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States in 1916 by President Woodrow Wilson. Brandeis was someone who supported workers' rights, championed fair wages, and fair working hours. In 1890, Brandeis made the case for the right to privacy in an article for the Harvard Law Review. He also took positions against the power of large banks, the money trusts, powerful corporations, monopolies, and public corruption, writing... We can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of the few, but we can't have both. Democracy rests upon two pillars. One, the principle that all men are equally entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the other, the conviction that such equal opportunity will most advance civilization. Significantly, Brandeis influenced the thinking of Woodrow Wilson. 
Wilson argued frequently that the economic changes of the industrial era required new thinking, and under Brandeis's tutelage, he became a leading advocate for antitrust as a way to realign economic and political power. The future, Brandeis hoped, would bring something more like cooperatives than the hierarchical corporations. Importantly, Brandeis recognized that economic structure parallel political structure. The federal government gained additional intervention powers in 1914 with the passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act, closing loopholes in the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The act defined as illegal certain business practices that led to the formation of monopolies. Certain types of holding companies and interlocking directorates were outlawed. From within academia, Wharton Professor Scott Nearing testified in 1914 before the Commission on Industrial Relations on the State of Working People. As I see it, we must stop this exploiting of the many for the benefit of the few. The people who hold mortgages and stock certificates and flaunt them before the eyes of civilization are contributing to this great unrest which is sweeping the country. Every man is entitled to what he earns, and if I had anything to do with this investigation, I would start it right there. The blatant evil of monopoly should be wiped out. When the United States entered the First World War, Nearing blamed the plutocracy. The entrance of the United States into the World War on April 6, 1917, was the greatest victory that the American plutocracy has won over the American democracy since the declaration of war with Spain in 1898. The American plutocracy urged the war, shouted for it, demanded it, insisted upon it, and finally got it. Reforms were severely threatened during the First World War as more than 1,000 prosecutions were initiated under the Espionage Act against radicals and pacifists. Scott Nearing and American Socialists were indicted during April of 1918 and stood trial in February 1919. Nearing acknowledged he was a socialist and that he viewed plutocracy as the real enemy. We socialists believe that the right of power is an economic power, and we therefore believe that whoever owns the job and the products and the surplus wealth will control ordinarily everything else in sight. Nearing was acquitted of all charges, but the American Socialist Party was found guilty of obstruction and fined. As Professor Saterman writes, the result is a downward spiral, a vicious circle in which economic inequality and the capture of the political system reinforce each other. This dynamic makes it more and more likely with each passing day that modern America is losing its character as a republic. And with that, we've reached the end of Lecture 5.